What reason could you possibly have for not obeying the Word of God? A lot of people say, I did not obey the gospel because, and they have a myriad of excuses. The excuses that people will give on the day of judgment will be their last great hope of defeating the Lord's plan of salvation. And they will not succeed. You know, just being a good person will not open heaven's doors. It just won't. Those who have rejected the commandment of Jesus Christ that we be obedient will be lost without that obedience to his word. Well, I didn't know God about God. I didn't know who God was. Nobody ever told me. I lived in the deepest part of Africa. No TV, no radio. Way out in the woods. People have all kinds of excuses of why they did not know God. But what does 2 Thessalonians 1 verses 7 through 9 teach us? And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Why will that excuse not work? Read Romans 1 verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. How can you say, I don't know God, if he's clearly seen? Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. When the sun comes up every morning and goes down every evening, God is exhibiting his power. And people will know there is a God. So there is no excuse. You cannot say, I did not know God. You know, God is not willing that anyone should perish. According to 2 Peter 3 verse 9. So he made sure that we had a way out of our sins so that we did not have to perish the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some count slackness but is long suffering towards us not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance if you were in Bible class this morning you know there was a space of about 30 minutes before the sounding of the trumpets. But I was sincere. I did everything my pastor told me to do. And I had full faith and trust in his preaching and teaching. I even sang in the choir. I was in the praise team. And I was also baptized as a baby. So I should be saved, shouldn't I? It tells us in Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Obedience. That's the word. Obedience. Doing the will of your pastor is not an acceptable excuse. Why didn't you study and read the word of God? The Lord's not going to like that, is he? You know, in Kings, it gives us an example of people who were truly sincere about what they believed. Chapter 18, verses 26 through 9 of 1 Kings. So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. 
they were really sincere. And they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was noon that Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is God, a God. Either he's meditating, or he's busy, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's sleeping, and he must be awakened. Our God doesn't sleep, does he? So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out of them. And when midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Look how sincere they were. Sincerely wrong. They had their faith in the wrong God, a little g God. Sincerity alone is not enough. One must worship God in spirit and in truth. John 4 verse 24. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, I was afraid. I was too scared to worship God. You know, I know that God wants us to be perfect and be like his son Jesus and no sin. And I know I didn't want to go in there and sit with a bunch of hypocrites in them pews. They think they're perfect and I'm not. And I know I'm not. So I thought it best not to go to church. What does God have to say about cowards? What does he think about cowards? Look at Matthew 25 verses 24 through 30. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you were a hard man. Reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went out and I hid your talent in the ground. See, look, you have what is yours. I'm going to paraphrase. He gave it back to him. And what did the Lord say? You're a wicked servant. And what did he tell him? Cast this unprofitable servant into outer darkness. You know, even Jesus was afraid from time to time. He was afraid of death. Yet he did the will of his Father. And he rightfully expects us to do the same thing. Mark 14, verses 34 through 36. Then he said unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Stay here and watch. And he went a little further and he fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. You know, it's not uncommon to be fearful of things. But you must also have courage and you must also take actions. The question is, are we ashamed of the gospel? The gospel of Christ, Romans 1 verse 16. Or will we be following Christ who died for our sins? Will we try to act like Christ and follow the Lord's command? You know, when the chips are down and the world is against us, will we be afraid and still follow Christ's commands? That time will come. You will have to make that decision. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That's what Paul said. And we need not be ashamed either. Oh, but my family would never approve of me joining your religion. You know, I've always been a Pharisee. And I will always be a Pharisee. And my family would turn against me and cut me out of the will. And ruin all my relationships with them if I went somewhere else. Hmm. You know, a man's family can be his enemy if they do not listen to the word of God. Matthew 10, verse 34 through 39. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. 
For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and her daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemy will be those of his own household. Did you hear that? And a man's enemy will be those of his own household. He who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves sons or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life and loses it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, we can see that a lack of knowledge in a family can cause division, even hatred, all because they're leaving Christ out of the family. They're looking only to their, themselves, their worldly existence. They need Christ in their lives. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long upon this earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. You know, that excuse would never work with the Lord. The family didn't bring him up right. Obedience to parents and love for our family is very important. But the family must never come before the obedience and love that we must have for our Lord and Savior and our God. Well, if I submitted to what you teach, I would be admitting that my loved one is lost. Because they didn't do all the things you teach. I would be admitting they were lost. That's a cry we've heard many a time from many a person, isn't it? Even in my own family, I have heard those things. And that excuse will not fly with the Lord. It may be a question that we ourselves want to ask and desire to have an answer for. When we lose a loved one to a righteous judgment. You know, it tells us in Leviticus 10, 1 through 7, that Aaron saw his sons, Nadab and Abihu, die. Right there before the Lord in their sins. And they were not allowed to mourn their loss. Moses said to Aram and to Eliezer and Ithmar, his sons, Do not uncover your heads nor tear, tear your clothes lest you die and wrath come upon all the people. But let the brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord has kindled. You shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of meeting lest you die, for the anointing of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the words of Moses. Do you think that they knew that they were lost because they died in their sins? Of course they did. That excuse will not fly with the Lord. It's obvious that the lost do not want those who are living to be lost. Looking at what Luke says in Luke 16, verse 27 through 31. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. What did Abraham say? Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Luke 16, verse 27 through 31. Is that not true of the world today? We know that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And yet the world is not persuaded 
They go on in their sins from day to day. You know, whether we obey or whether we don't obey, those who are dead have already sealed their fate. They just don't want us to have the same fate if they're lost. One thing that we, do, we must do, and that is make sure that we are obedient to God ourselves. Obedient to the commands that Jesus has left us. So that we don't wind up with those who are lost. Oh, but I'm going to have to give up all of my earthly pleasures. All of my riches, all of my fun, all of the good things of life. To live the kind of life you want me to live. I just can't do that. Do you know you own nothing of this world anyway? And you're not going to take any of it with you to eternity? Look what Jesus told that rich man. Luke 18 verses 22 through 23. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. And you will have treasures laid up in heaven. Come and follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorry because he was very rich. You know, everything you have here is nothing. You're only here on a testing ground to see if you're willing to be obedient to the Lord. The Lord wants servants, those who are willing to obey him. You know, you must make a decision concerning your earthly wealth and make a choice between earthly wealth and heavenly wealth. It's just a matter of priorities, isn't it? Which one do you want worse? What means the most to you? By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures, the passing pleasures, the fleeting pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the riches in Egypt, for he looked for the reward. That's what we should be doing. That's where our attention should be focused. I'd have to give up earthly pleasures as no excuse. The Lord will not accept it. You know, all of the pleasures in the world, when they're combined, could not make even one second in hell's fire worth bearing it. Matthew 16, verse 26. For what profit is a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Do you have enough money to buy your soul from God? No, you don't. God owns it all to begin with. Well, I was raised in a godless environment. That's the only thing I can think of. I just never knew him because it was a godless environment. You know, even people who are raised in a God-filled environment can and may and will and have left that God-filled environment for a godless one that they created themselves. Second Chronicles uh, chapter 28, verses 22 through 25. Now in the times of his distress, there are people that are really putting pressure on him, King Ahaz became increasingly unfaithful to the Lord. Now that is King Ahaz. For he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus, which had defeated him, saying, Because the gods of the king of Syria helped them, I will sacrifice to, to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and all Israel. Here was a man who was of God to begin with, a king of Israel, who stepped out of the realm of godliness into ungodliness. Hezekiah, his son, did not remain in that godless environment that his father created. 
the one in which he raised him, the one that he, his father created for him. Second Chronicles 29 verses 1 and 2. Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of God according to all that his father David had done. David was the father of the nation, therefore he was a child of David. Hezekiah also reversed the godliness that his father had done in Israel according to 2 Kings chapter 18 verses 3 through 6. He removed the most high places and broke the sacred pillars down. He cut down the wooden images and broke into pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. Did you ever wonder what happened to that serpent? On the rod that they worshipped there in, or that they bowed before in the wilderness? That's what happened to it. Hezekiah destroyed it. And why? For until those days the children of Israel burned incense to it, and they called it Nehushtan. And he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him there were none like him among all the kings of Judah, and none were like him before, none before him. So regardless of our circumstances, God gives each one of us a responsibility to come to know him. And to act according to his word. Acts 17 verse 30. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent. Well. I'm unfaithful because my parents were faithful Christians. Hmm? Well I can't be faithful. My parents were faithful Christians. What does it say in Ezekiel 18 verse 20? The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the sins of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. You cannot go to heaven on your parents' coattails. My parents were faithful Christians, therefore I don't have to be. I'll just ride in with them. It's not going to work. We can see that in 2 Samuel chapter 13. You know, as faithful as the house of King David was, Satan was there to corrupt his children. Look at the first verse, 2 Samuel chapter 13. After this, Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sitter, a sister, her name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. We're talking about a son, a daughter, and a son. Amnon took his sister Tamar against her will. And he was killed by his brother Absalom for the treachery. So here we have rape and murder taking place in the house of David. And it was plotted among his children. Even though David was faithful. They're not going to heaven on his coattail. You know we read that Hezekiah righted the wrongs of his father Ahaz. Only to have his righteousness reversed by his son, Manasseh. 2 Kings 21 verses 1 through 9. For he rebuilt the high places where Hezekiah his father had destroyed. He raised up altars to Baal. He made a wooden image as Ahab the king of Israel had done. And he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. He also built altars in the house of the Lord. Of which the Lord have said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. 2 Kings 21 verses 1 through 9. On the day of judgment, we will stand and be judged as individuals. Not as a family, not as a congregation, but individually. 
Each one will be held accountable for his own sins, not those of his close relatives or his other family members. Well, educated people told me that a church is a crutch. You just have to have a crutch to get through life. And I'm not going to have a crutch. I'm man enough, I can stand on my own. Well, you know that most of the preachers and pastors with a doctor's degree in theology in the midst of their perceived righteousness have been responsible for leading most of the world into sin and away from Christ with false teaching. Add to them the professors and the chancellors of the universities and we have a pretty atheistic nation because they do not believe in the Bible. Nor do they believe in the word of God. This was true even when the Apostle Paul talked to the educated people in Athens. Looking at Acts 17 verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. While others said, we will hear more on this matter again. Education does not mean that you know what you're talking about. You know, it was true, even in the time of the Apostle Paul, that these educated men would reject the word of God. They were educated and wise in their own eyes, and in the eyes of the world, but not in the eyes of God. 2 Corinthians 18, verse 29. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak among the things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Some people are just too smart for their own britches. That's what my mama used to tell me when I was a kid. Sometimes you're just too smart for your own britches. 1 Timothy 6 verse 20. O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid the profane and idle babbling and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Everyone educated is not really educated in the word of God. Paul trusted Timothy with the gospel and with his teachings and he was told to guard against that false knowledge. You know, God has given us the evidence to know the truth and the intelligence to stand for it as long as we realize that we must be obedient to God and do what he asks us to do. Well, I just don't know enough to be a Christian. I never had a Bible study. I uh, just have to believe what my, bro my pastor says the truth is, and uh, I don't have time to do Bible study at all. You know, all truth is found in the Word of God. If you want to know the truth, that's where you need to go. John 8, verse 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It is knowable. It's just a matter of whether or not you want to study. Remember Philip? Philip in the eunuch? Then Philip opened his mouth and began teaching at this scripture. This is back in Isaiah. Preached to him, Jesus. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said to him, See, here is water. What does hinder me from being baptized? Acts 8, verses 35 through 36. Countless New Testament examples show us that all we need to know is that one, we're lost. Two, we need to be in Christ in order to have that salvation. And this is how you get into Christ. That's all we need to know. We can learn that in one lesson if we fully understand what's being taught. Well, I was waiting for a more convenient day. I just don't have time. I have a family to feed. I have a job that I have to take care of. I have sheep and cattle I have to feed. I don't have time for worship. There are more things that are more important. It's not convenient for me. We know what Paul 
taught Felix about Christ and things to come. Acts 24, verses 24 and 25. Felix said, or Felix was reasoning now about righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come, and he was afraid. And he said, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. He knew, but he put other things ahead of the Word of God. Same is true for those that uh, Paul was teaching in Athens in Acts 17, verse 32. You know, knowing that we are not promised tomorrow, how could we know the truth and not listen and obey it? How could we walk away from the truth waiting in our sins, knowing that the Lord could come at any moment? Waiting for a more convenient day is not acceptable to the Lord. Well, I was almost persuaded. You know, I, could, I know enough, I could, you know, any time go back and be a Christian. I was almost persuaded. Hmm. I used to go there, but I don't go there anymore. What he's trying to say is, yeah, I was almost persuaded. I was almost a Christian. The Apostle Paul was trotted out before King Agrippa for entertainment. But they heard... Paul's gospel instead. He wasn't all that entertained. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Close, but no horseshoe. We have several examples in John. There was a man among the Pharisees named Nicodemus who was a ruler of the Jews. And he came to Jesus by night. And he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. No one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. He's almost persuaded, isn't he? The Pharisees sent officers to arrest Jesus. They returned empty-handed. Of course, the Pharisees wanted to know what happened. And the officers answered and said, No man ever spoke like this man. Almost persuaded. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? John 7, verse 46 through 48. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. He was almost persuaded, but he's not enough to stand up to the Jews, was he? But he did ask for the body of Christ. Matthew 7, verse 21. When the morning came, all the chief priests and elders and people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. They were almost persuaded that he needed to be killed. They were plotting to put him to death. Almost cannot avail. Almost is but to fail. Sad, sad, that bitter wail. Almost, but lost. So how do I obey? That's the question that needs to be answered. How do I obey? Therefore I say unto you that you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am He. You will die in your sins. But I tell you no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Therefore whoever confesses me before men I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. The question this morning is,
a technical glitch. Are you willing to read your excuse card on the day of judgment? Are you willing to read it to God and hear his judgment about your excuse? I want to offer you an invitation. Remember, to be almost persuaded is to be totally lost.